We end here tonight with a sleeping giant, an ancient super volcano beneath Yellowstone National Park. That's what it's supposed to do. It's one of the most dynamic places on Earth. Think about a natural force so powerful that it has the potential to significantly change the world's climate, wipe out ecosystems, and endanger millions of lives. Such a force lurks beneath our planet, waiting for the right time to release its fury. The Apalaki Caldera, the recently discovered and the world's largest known caldera, is one of these possible risks. While it is not as well known as Yellowstone or the Toba supervolcano, its potential impact on the Earth should not be underestimated. And so in today's video, let's investigate NASA's recent findings, how it compares to the Yellowstone caldera, and how devastating it will be if it erupts. First, let's compare the Apalaki caldera and the Yellowstone caldera. Let's explore the similarities and differences between these two geological giants, examining their locations, sizes, structures, formation processes, potential eruption impacts, and historical eruption records. Location. The Yellowstone Caldera is located in Yellowstone National Park, which spans parts of Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho in the United States. The caldera is located largely in Northwest Wyoming and is part of the greater Yellowstone Plateau. While the Apalaki Caldera is located on the Benham Rise, an underwater volcanic plateau in the Philippine Sea to the east of the Philippines' main island, Luzon. Due to its underwater position, Apalaki is less accessible and investigated than Yellowstone. Size The Yellowstone Caldera is about 55 kilometers, 34 miles, in diameter. It is one of the world's greatest active volcanic systems, known for its geothermal features, including geysers, hot springs, and fumaroles. However, the Apalaki Caldera is much larger, with an estimated circumference of about 150 kilometers, 93 miles. This makes it the largest known caldera on Earth, dwarfing the massive Yellowstone Caldera. Structure The Yellowstone Caldera has a complex structure, including a vast depression caused by the collapse of a magma chamber following enormous eruptions. The area is known for its high degree of geothermal activity, with numerous geysers, hot springs, and fumaroles indicating the presence of a huge active magma chamber beneath the surface. Likewise, the Apalaki caldera has a complex structure too, including a wide, bowl-shaped depression typical of calderas. The underwater location adds levels of complexity, with volcanic characteristics like vents, lava domes, and hydrothermal systems. The caldera floor is predominantly made up of basaltic rock, reflecting a history of fluid lava eruptions. Formation Processes Over the last 2.1 million years, three massive volcanic eruptions have created the Yellowstone caldera. These eruptions were so massive that they emptied the magma chamber beneath, causing the ground above to collapse and form the caldera. The most recent of these eruptions happened roughly 640,000 years back. The creation of the Apalaki caldera is thought to have been caused by one or more massive volcanic eruptions that happened millions of years ago. The presence of basaltic rock shows that the eruptions involved extremely fluid lava with magma storage and release playing an important role in sculpting the caldera's current shape. Historical Eruption Records Yellowstone has a well-documented eruption history, with the most notable taking place at 2.1 million, 1.3 million, and 640,000 years ago. These eruptions have been well examined, yielding vital insights into the caldera's volcanic activity and probable future behavior. As for Apalaki Caldera, detailed historical eruption records are rare due to the Apalaki Caldera's underwater position and its comparatively recent discovery. Ongoing geological research and sediment analysis aims to expose the region's volcanic activity history, but much more remains to be learned about the time and frequency of previous eruptions. Potential Eruption Impacts an explosion from the Yellowstone caldera would have catastrophic consequences. It might spew massive volumes of volcanic ash into the atmosphere, resulting in a volcanic winter 
that could dramatically reduce the Earth's temperatures. The ash fallout would destroy crops, hinder air transport, and pose significant health hazards owing to respiratory issues. However, the possible eruption of the Apalaki caldera would be as devastating, but with added challenges due to its underwater location. An eruption might cause massive tsunamis that devastate coastal areas. So, let's now check what can trigger the eruption understanding. What can trigger the eruption of the Apalaki caldera requires a deep dive into geological processes, tectonic activity, magma dynamics, and the unique conditions of its underwater location. Several factors can influence the stability of a caldera, and for a structure as massive as Apalaki, these triggers can be complex and multifaceted. So, here are the primary factors that could potentially trigger an eruption of the Apalaki caldera. Plate movements. The movement of the Earth's lithospheric plates can cause significant stress in the Earth's crust. Apalaki rests on the Philippine Sea Plate, which interacts with numerous other plates, including the Eurasian and Pacific plates. The convergence, divergence, or transform motions of these plates can cause considerable geological stress. The subduction of the Philippine Sea Plate beneath nearby plates can cause stress building and magma formation. The melting of subducted oceanic crust can produce magma, which can eventually rise to the surface. Tectonic movements can trigger earthquakes, which can split the crust and open up channels for magma to rise. A large earthquake in the area could cause an eruption by disrupting the magma chamber beneath Apalaki. Magma Chamber Dynamics The constant injection of fresh magma into the chamber from deeper inside the Earth's mantle raises pressure. If the magma influx rate exceeds the outflow rate, pressure will increase. Magma contains dissolved gases such as water vapor, carbon dioxide, and sulfur dioxide. As magma rises, the pressure falls, forcing these gases to exsolve and expand, raising the magma chamber's internal pressure. When the pressure in the magma chamber surpasses the strength of the surrounding rock, the rock can fracture. These fissures can allow magma to travel to the surface, perhaps resulting in an explosion. Water-Magma Interaction The Apalaki caldera's underwater location allows for extensive interaction between water and magma. When seawater comes in touch with magma, it can cause explosive volcanic activity. These eruptions occur when water and magma interact, resulting in fast water evaporation and explosive magma fragmentation. This sort of eruption can be quite violent and is typical in underwater volcanic settings. Hydrothermal vents and hot springs within the caldera may indicate the existence of active magma. Changes in hydrothermal activity, such as higher temperatures or gas emissions, can indicate an imminent eruption. Earthquake swarms. Clusters of minor to moderate earthquakes, known as earthquake swarms, can precede volcanic eruptions. These swarms represent magma movement within the crust and have the potential to undermine the caldera structure. Volcanic tremors, which are continuous low-frequency seismic waves, can indicate magma flow. An increase in tremor activity may indicate that magma is ascending to the surface. Human activity. While less common, human activities such as deep sea drilling, geothermal energy extraction, or explosive detonation have the potential to disrupt the magma chamber or the caldera's structural stability. So, what type of caldera is the Apalaki caldera? Calderas are classified into various categories, each with its own unique features and development procedures. Apalaki is classified as a submarine caldera. Submarine calderas exist underwater, usually along mid-ocean ridges or volcanic arcs. These calderas can be formed by explosive eruptions or the collapse of underwater volcanoes. Another example is the Kikai caldera in southern Kyushu, Japan. It originated approximately 7,300 years ago during a major eruption. The caldera is characterized by active hydrothermal vents and ongoing volcanic activity. Crater Lake Calderas Crater Lake calderas arise when a volcano erupts explosively, 
ejecting massive amounts of magma and leaving a void. The overlaying rock collapses into the vacuum, leaving a depression. This depression frequently fills with water, resulting in a crater lake, typically round in shape. A lake has formed after being filled with water, frequently has steep walls and can be extremely deep. Crater Lake in Oregon, USA, is a classic example of a crater lake caldera. It developed approximately 7,700 years ago when Mount Mazama erupted explosively. The caldera is filled with water, becoming the United States' deepest lake at around 594 meters, 1,949 FT, deep. Resurgent calderas. Resurgent calderas emerge as a result of repeated eruptions and collapse. Following an initial eruption and collapse, the caldera floor may rise or resurge when magma beneath it moves. This resurgence has the potential to trigger additional volcanic activity and collapses. The Yellowstone caldera is a well-known resurgent caldera. Over the last two million years, it has gone through multiple cycles of eruption and uplift. Shield Volcano Calderas Shield Volcano Calderas arise on shield volcanoes, which are distinguished by their broad, gentle slopes built of low-viscosity basaltic lava. When the magma chamber beneath a shield volcano partially empties, the peak may collapse and form a caldera. Mauna Loa is the world's largest shield volcano, and Moku Aweoweo, the summit caldera, is a prime example. The caldera is approximately 6 kilometers 3.7 miles long and 3 kilometers 1.9 miles broad, and it was produced by the collapse of the peak during volcanic eruptions. As the pressure was relieved through these cracks, the dissolved gases would erupt, rapidly emptying the magma across the park. Volcanic ash and debris would be propelled several miles into the atmosphere, reaching heights greater than Mount Everest. A molten ash layer, around 10 feet thick, would extend up to 1,000 miles from the park, covering most of the Rocky Mountains and the Midwest, and stretching into the Pacific Northwest and Southern Canada. This dense and extensive ash would spare no life or structure within its range, leading to significant lahar flows and burying everything it reaches. Rescuers might have difficulty accessing the area because the ash blocks all entry points from the ground. Additionally, the ash and gases spreading into the atmosphere would likely disrupt most air travel, similar to the impact of a smaller volcano eruption in Iceland in 2010. The consequences following such an eruption extend well beyond the loss of human life. The large amount of ash expelled into the atmosphere would significantly affect air travel, affect air communication systems, and the overall infrastructure of the United States and parts of Canada. Globally, the aftermath would involve a layer of ash traveling across continents, reaching the UK within five days. This ash cloud, possibly ascending 25 miles high, would seriously affect air quality, leading to respiratory problems and health issues worldwide. The ash would also blanket the soil, disrupt machinery, and significantly impact food supplies by harming crops, resulting in substantial price hikes and a potential famine. The ash cloud could also be a barrier, blocking sunlight and decreasing global temperatures by 3 to 5 degrees Celsius. This substantial decrease could result in a regional or global volcanic winter, causing long-term changes in weather patterns. Crucial for maintaining the balance of our ecosystem, plant life would encounter a catastrophic hurdle. The thick layer of volcanic ash blocking sunlight would impede the process of photosynthesis and result in widespread plant mortality. This could lead to failures in worldwide crop production, disrupting the food chain and impacting species far from the initial eruption area. Water bodies would also be affected. Ash and other volcanic materials would enter rivers and lakes, impacting water quality and aquatic life. The sudden introduction of these materials could suffocate fish and other marine organisms, destabilizing freshwater ecosystems. The eruption of Pinatubo in 1991 caused the planet to cool by approximately 1 degree sas, 1.8 degree sas, for several years. The eruption of Tambora in 1815 caused enough cooling to harm crops globally, 
potentially causing famines in certain regions. These were relatively small eruptions compared to the potential capabilities of a supervolcano. Could a Yellowstone super eruption lead to an extinction level event? The idea of such a catastrophic incident is disturbing, but a supervolcanic eruption at Yellowstone is not considered an extinction level event, ELE. Even though such an eruption would have devastating outcomes with substantial local and possibly worldwide impacts, it would not lead to a mass extinction event or indicate the annihilation of the human species. Given the intricacy and seriousness of the potential eruption of the Yellowstone caldera, it is vital to comprehend its far-reaching implications. This geological occurrence possesses the power to significantly change life on our planet. Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, YVO, oversees monitoring systems at Yellowstone. These systems observe seismic activity, ground deformation, and volcanic emissions to identify any indications of heightened volcanic activity in the Yellowstone region. This allows for timely monitoring and assessment of potential hazards, aiding in better comprehension and preparation for potential volcanic incidents. When is it expected to erupt again? Scientific knowledge assures us that although Yellowstone has not erupted in many thousands of years, the chances of such an event are slim. The underground magma chamber at Yellowstone consists mainly of solid rock, with only 5 to 15 percent in a molten state, indicating that there may not be enough magma to support another catastrophic super-eruption. Experts clarify the misconception that Yellowstone is overdue for an eruption by emphasizing that volcanoes do not operate on fixed schedules and erupt when specific magma supply and pressure conditions are met. The USGS has indicated that it is very likely that Yellowstone will not experience an eruption for the next several centuries. The main hazards are expected to be ongoing geysers, earthquakes, and ground uplift. According to Lowenstern, Earth will experience super eruptions in the future, and it's uncertain whether they will occur in Yellowstone. He also states that Yellowstone has already had a long lifespan and may not have another eruption. Volcanoes eventually die out, and the magma chamber beneath Yellowstone is influenced by the heat from below and the relative cold from the surface. If less heat enters from below, the chamber could freeze and become a solid granite body. It's important to note that the volcanic hotspot beneath Yellowstone is gradually moving to the northeast, or more precisely, the North American tectonic plate above the hotspot is moving southwest. Thanks a lot for tuning in. If you like this video and want to see more similar content, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Also, Share your thoughts in the comments section below.